So, past week, the Zendikar Rising Championship gave us a window into a... I mean, actually just a a revisitation of some of Magic's great players, actually, in the top eight. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's a a solid crew, right? I mean, uh, and this is... Like, obviously, they keep changing the branding and the name and stuff, but this is... At the very least, kind of the stakes of a pro tour, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I, I think of it as as very pro tour like. I mean, they're we're in a compromised universe right now in terms of paper magic versus versus mythic championships online, etc. I, I I like that they're keeping keeping it alive the way that they can. It's obviously different yeah. than, uh, than I just meant like in terms of scale, like it's. It's at the level of a of a pro tour with regards to the uh, the dollars. Oh, oh, the number of Benjamins falling from the sky. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's a split format, of course, between standard and historic. Uh, where, where do you want to start first? Uh, let's start with Brad Nelson. That's a classic place to start. That makes me think we're starting at standard. Yeah. <laughs> Brad Nelson's pretty synonymous with standard. With standard excellence. Uh, Brad's going with your personal uh, pet deck, you know, monogreen food. And uh, there's a couple, you know, in true Brad Nelson fashion, there's some, uh, there's some tuning. You know, there's a little bit of different tuning than we... Uh, we don't always see the same choices here. Uh, the first thing that jumps out at me is the uh, the land, like uh, the resource row situation. Outside of the you know relatively common four gilded goose, four tangled florahedron, four kazandu mammoth, like all that's pretty normal. But the the use of two bonders enclave, two crawling barons, and four castle garenbrig gives him a lot more uh, action out of his lands than we like than we've you know basically ever seen out of this archetype in the this time around. Well talk to me about crawling barons. Like that that's a card that, you know, we've seen it's it's, it's existed, right? But uh it's it's obviously, you know, doing something here and it is a, a very specific choice by one of the top standard deck designers. So uh, in okay, you know how like with uh, Kazandu Mammoth, you have a chance to have more mana consistency early on, but also a potent threat later. Uh, and the opportunity cost is just not that high. I mean, you're spending a mana whenever you're playing it as a tap land, but like it's not the highest opportunity cost, right? Yeah, yeah. The crawling barons. It, oh, go ahead. No, I mean just like. I guess it just depends. Like you, you, as long as it's not your only land, it's it's fine, right? It's very low, very low negative impact for you. Yeah, and this isn't a deck that operates very effectively on one land anyway. But <laughs> I guess, between I guess the florahedron and the mammoth, and yeah, between the florahedron and the mammoth, the deck's more than half mana, and more than half the cards in the deck can be played as a land. So. Uh, you're going to very consistently be hitting all your drops. But the uh, Crawling Barons gives you more sustain. It gives you another way not only to, con- to convert your uh, to convert one of your lands into another threat, it importantly gives you something left over. You know, like if, if somebody actually is, uh, is actually trying, you know, trying to fight you, it's kind of nice having one more threat in reserve. But uh, the biggest thing is just being able to convert your resources effectively. Uh, do you think that this gives the deck like some sort of resilience against removal? Right, like I, this. The deck's got like you know big guys, big big spells, big threats. But uh, you know maybe maybe doesn't like to have uh, all of its stuff killed. 
Well, the biggest spot is uh, continuing the diversification with extinction event. When people extinction event you, normally they're going to be able to get which other, whichever half you have more in, right? So, like, it's pretty hard normally to, like, to, to be in a situation where somebody extinction eventing isn't going to be getting at least half your board. But if you have three threats and one of them's crawling barons, now your opponent can't actually, uh, they, they can't actually get uh, above half. You know, they actually get below half. Because if you have like an odd and even and a crawling barons, you're pretty covered against extinction event. So what are the, what are the unique elements of this deck other than just playing some Crawling Barons and four copies of Castle Garenbrig? There's a, an extra Witch's Oven, right? Uh, there's an Ugin in the main deck. Uh, and that Ugin is something we talked about last week that's sure, sure. growing in popularity a little bit. Um, the two more Ugins in the sideboard. This is actually pretty Planeswalker, uh, Planeswalker-ish, right, with two Vivian's Monsters Advocate as well as the, uh, the Ugins in the sideboard. Um... This six, like, usually I think going to be good chance it's the biggest deck at the table. Uh, it, it depends on which kind of big. I think that the, the kind of end games that a lot of people have, it's not always just a, a straight hierarchy. You know, like if you're playing against somebody who can dance of the manse, that's pretty big. Okay, that's fair. Like a Yorion dance of the manse deck. But um, in this case, I think that the. Uh, the Brad's list is actually a little less crazy than Gabriel and the Seif's list. Oh, right. Okay. Like the, the, yeah, like the, the spicy one, uh, is definitely Gab who's playing, uh, a Vivian monsters advocate instead of the Ugin, uh, at least in the main. And then, um, shaving a Brontodon, and uh, a witch's oven in order to fit two copies of Kogla, the Titanate. Oh, yeah, I like this one a lot, right? So we've talked about Kogla several times, and we've recently talked about it in this archetype. Uh, also shaving a witch's oven, right? Unlike Brad with the three witch's ovens. Yellow right. Hat has only got two. And this is a shave I was not expecting. Only three copies of Trail of Crumbs. I guess you gotta, you know, make room for, for King Kong over here. Interesting. It is weird. Well, in this case, I think the Trail of Crumbs is actually kind of replaced by the Ilse and Karyatid for just a little bit of extra mana. Yeah, on curve. So it is weird, though, don't you think, taking out Trail of Crumbs, which is, I think, like a big part of this archetype's identity, uh, as well as a low curve card um, at all, right? But then certainly to add add a additional Gigundos expensive dudes. Yeah, it's... You know, not the first trim that comes to mind, but it's also not the type of trim you just do willy nilly. Like if Nasif cut it, I don't think that was his first. Uh, that that wasn't the starting spot of how to get the room. So this deck has got. I think this is a pretty spicy sideboard. I mean, as far as mono green decks and standard go, he's yeah, I was got- going to say for as far as Nasif sideboards go. Okay. We're talking about a range of, uh, you know, some overlaps here. Uh, but one Primal Might, one Ram Through, because you got to keep them guessing. Well, and what's funny is that most people don't play either one these days. Yeah, it, it's also funny. I think a lot of the folks have, you know, historically thought, like, Primal Might is the main deck card. Ram Through is the sideboard removal card. But even sometimes you're just like, you might start Ram through in the sideboard, but you had an idea about which one you thought was better generally. Now nah, one and one, one and one. Well, and what's interesting here, uh, almost nothing has trampled, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not not nothing. The Troll King has trampled. He's, he's, he's yeah. I mean, that's the only one, player. right? Uh, I, I think you are correct. Yes, I guess you do get to set up the seven ball though. It's kind of a big hit. Um, uh, do you like Sorcerer's Spyglass? No, I hate that card, actually. What are you Spyglassing in this format? Like, What does one Spyglass that's so attractive to make you want to play it in a mono green deck where it's like kind of off message? Well, Are you just Spyglassing the Planeswalkers? Like Ugin or Ashiok? 
look, I think like sometimes you play a deck like this, which does not have, I guess Nassif has more removal than the average person playing on green. He doesn't have a lot of removal, a lot of like various types. He's got two Hogwarts main plus the two fight cards, you know? I don't know, man. I don't know what to tell you. One of the greatest deck designers of all time. At least this card doesn't cost very much mana. True. Uh, are you still liking uh, Mono Green better than the uh, the Gruel decks? No, I like, like the uh, Gruel decks more. Oh, I like that. So, talk to me about Merkel's Gruel Adventure deck. I mean, first of all, I just want to talk about Merkel. Merkel <laughs> coming. What is it, like seventeen years after Merkel won that Pro Tour, something like that. It's been a while. Uh, a great champion of uh, you know the physical Magic of the Gathering cards. I believe he won a Pro Tour Kobe. Um, but anyway, super shout out to him. I, I am very, very big admirer of uh, his uh, ability to have played uh, regular paper magic in the past. Translating his game to digital here. Uh, this deck is about what we've talked about. I mean, one a Crowan War in the main deck, uh, 20 lands lands. Uh, obviously, there are some Shatter Calls, Bashings, and, and so on that you can cheat with, but this isn't, this isn't too fancy in any direction, is it? No, I mean, it depends on what you can say. It's not really fancy. It's just got, it's got a couple cards rounding it out that actually all seem like reasonable. It's like, why is there one Rimrock Knight, and one Ember, Ember a Shield Breaker, and one Primal Might, and one the Akroan War? Because, like, there were some slots left over, and, you know? I mean, variability is an asset sometimes, right? So, uh, I mean, none of those cards is ever... I mean, the Crone War maybe, but none of those cards are really ever that bad. Uh, and sometimes they're really good, right? Like, in the right matchup, uh, that Ember of Shieldbreaker is going to look really fantastic. Um, in the right spot, Rimrock Knight looks really good. I mean, obviously, if you're going to like win the lottery with Rimrock Knight and Ember Cleave and, and uh, Questing Beast all at the same time probably pretty happy you had a Rimrock Knight. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I mean, maybe it's weird, but I really like the Garrick Unleashed in the sideboard. Well, talk to me about that. That's not a card you've ever been too high about in the past. Uh, so in this context, so uh, first of all, the, uh, the plus, not only does it, you know, it can hit pretty hard uh, right away, but it, it gives you a way to kind of not be overextended against Extinction Event. And uh, some of your cards work pretty well with it. You know, like, for instance, if the board were to get sweeped and you drop uh, Brushfire Elemental, you are seriously in business. And uh, Yeah, that could be a the, lot of uh, damage. Ember Cleave, Garrick uh, Unleashed bonus with Ember Cleave is just like basically infinite damage right i mean yeah like <laughs> it's plus three plus three uh and then whatever they had to start with that's at least infinite right if you turn it sideways and then importantly this uh this minus two ability can really help you fight fair games where you're both just trying to you know be kind of mid-rangey like, sometimes you'll use it as kind of a quasi-call of the herd. But, like, I think a lot of the time what you want to do is drop Garrick, play a play a beast, then buff the beast, and you're already hitting for six, plus you still have Garrick. It's just a way to help diversify the threats. Typically, people always play the fives, you know, and here we still see some of them. It's just that uh, Oxva, Gonus, and Vivian, it's like, you only have so much room for fives. I actually like getting a little bit better, you know, making better use of the four drop spot than these decks normally take advantage of. That's what I was thinking, right? Like Vivian Monsters Advocate is a two of here in Merkel sideboard. It's a card we saw in the mono green decks uh, played by, by Brad, by Nassif. Uh, I, I think if you're in a grindy situation, just being able to get, I guess this is kind of a card advantage engine out maybe a turn earlier that's just in an advantage in and of itself. Yep. 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 Very important being able to, uh, to keep speed when you're playing like this deck is not 
at risk of being the most powerful or second most powerful. Like uh, you really need to keep that tempo advantage while at the same time having the flexibility, the ability to go a little bit bigger for the uh, post cyborg games. I agree with you. It's not, you know, going to trick anybody into thinking it's the most powerful, but I think that it does a really good impression of the most powerful when you're combining a bit of the speed from the green side, a bit of the pump, some green, some red, and just the explosiveness of Embercleave, right? Like, that's really what the mono green deck is missing. Like, like the ceiling on mono green is probably much higher. They've got Ugin. They've got much bigger creatures and Kogla and, and Feasting Troll King. But just the fact that the the red green deck can play Embercleave and they can't, you know, they can turn... They, I mean, Questing Beast of Embercleave really feels like the most powerful thing when you're up against it a lot of the time, especially in a fair matchup. A mono green deck is not good against an, an Ember Cleave swinging Questing Beast. Uh, so which which build do you like better? Um, Merkel's list or uh, Autumn Burchett's very, very similar list that just is a little more streamlined with uh, three copies of Embereth Shieldbreaker? You know, like trimming the, uh, well, trimming one extra Questing Beast and then cleaning up that Rimrock Knight situation and... Uh, just going a little bit more into actually being able to uh, to fight people's uh, witches' ovens and um, and and the like, you know. I gotta say, I like Merkel's better. I think like Ember Shieldbreaker is a pretty mediocre card when you're not, you know, breaking shields before you're knighting them. Uh, on the other hand, I understand it's only like one Rimrock Knight or whatever, but that is a kind of card when you have a one of that can just be really telling when combined with haste creatures like Questing Beast or haste creatures like Brushfire Elemental, um, you know, stuff out of the sideboard. Totally. But here's why I like Autumn's list better. Uh, if you're playing against um, Mono Green, being able to hit the Great Henge as well as Witch's Oven. That's like a big game, right? I mean, that is a really big game, right? If you can't deal with their Great Henge, they're probably just going to be... I mean, even though they're not then, casting creatures, just gaining the life is bad for you. Right, and then in the mirror, being able to hit the other person's Great Henge or Embercleave? That's big. I mean, counterpoint, I think that... that I like Merkel's fourth questing beast a lot more than Autumn's second Embereth Shieldbreaker. Or third in this case? E- even the second one, right? Like, that's the, you know, you could. Or, th- I, yeah, I'm sorry, third, yes. Yes, third. Second or third. And then, but man, you, like, when your opponent drops Maze Mind Tome, it's kind of sweet to have the Shieldbreaker instead of questing beast. Um,. I can't argue with you there. There are a lot of situations that that you can think up or anybody can think up where Emperor's Shieldbreaker is going to look really good. I mean, it's total casting cost between uh, the the front side and the the two one knight is just the same as an Uktabi orangutan, but it's just way more economical because you can pull them off in in separate separate chunks instead of so it, so if it, it's already being a reasonable comparison to cards that have been staples in other formats, right? Except it's just better. I mean, unless you care that much about the second toughness. So if you're in those situations, especially it's like on first turn and they go like first turn uh, oven and you didn't have another one drop running the battle display right there is actually fantastic, right? So it's, there's a lot of spots where it's going to look really, really good. I think the question is, are you are you more aligned towards the meta? Are you more aligned towards... Um, a kind of little give and go, or are you more aligned towards your own core plan? And I think that Merkel's deck is a little, you know, Questing Beast and a little more extra explosiveness from Rimrock Knight. It's more like, I think I have a good plan, versus Autumn's is more like, I have a pretty good plan, but I, I want to I wanna hedge a little. I want to hedge, hedge the henge, maybe. Uh, what did you think of the return of uh, Demir Rogues this time with Gatwick the Wizen. I I like it uh, for a couple of reasons. 
Uh, one of them just being, I think people were kind of sleeping on it. If you look at both Merkel's deck and Autumn's deck, they had a couple of copies of Ox of Agonis, but it was not that long ago that people were crazy enough to have Ox of Agonis in their main deck. They were just maxed out on Phoenixes. They had like seven of those guys after sideboarding. So I think like any sitch where people are just like a little bit sleeping on Demir Rogues, it's it's like it I, it feels to me obviously lower magnitude, but it feels to me like you know when you go back and look at Star City Open events and you look at like the performance of Dredge, and you could just tell if the Dredge would do well depending on the average number of graveyard hate cards in the top eight. Like so, if everybody had eight graveyard hate cards in the top eight then you know, Dredge would just lose in the top eight. But if they only had four on average or, like, three, Dredge would always win those tournaments. I think it's kind of like that. That, like, the Demir Rogues deck demands more respect than some of the other decks in the format. It's not Dredge level, right, maybe, but it does demand more respect. And if you only give it a little respect, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do disproportionate uh, damage to you. Uh, and to answer your question about Gadwick... There's only one in the main deck. I thought it was less weird than Zareth Sand, the Trickster Times 2. But you know I love Gadwick. You convinced me oh, to no. love Gadwick years ago, back when we were children, and I, I love him still. Dude, Zareth Sand, the Trickster, makes total sense here because uh, the only reason that people weren't playing it before was because they were playing Luris the Dream Dead. This list has uh, Forsaken Luris. In order to play four Brazen Borrower, a Gatwick, and two Zareths. I mean, Zareth is just a pretty decent card, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it has a lot of the trappings of a really good card. I mean, I think the fact that it has Flash is just really, I mean, well, really you get to play, it just gives you a great game, dimension. Right? When you're playing with four Brazen Borrower and four Zareth, you're doing something a little different than what the other Rogues decks were doing. Yeah, I mean, also, and importantly, this deck has less removal. I mean, you got the flexibility always of drowning the lock, right? But like uh, with you know keeping the Lull Mage's dom- dominations in the sideboard and just one copy of Blood Chief's Thirst. Um, I mean, this is definitely has a, a different texture than a lot of the Rogues decks, right? Like nineteen creatures. I mean, we saw a lot of. Rogue's decks with eight creatures. Yeah. Well, I was even just going to say Thieves Guild Enforcer also has Flash. There's like a big Flash component to the deck, right? Um, yeah, this is meaningfully different than the, the decks we saw before. Do you think it's more aligned to just traditional sort of creature racing as a result of having more creatures, including like four fours? Uh, I wouldn't say racing as much. I mean, you're kind of playing a tempo game. This deck's really embracing, you know, making plays at awkward times for the other person. You're not, I, I don't think you're racing as much as you're trying to find uh, spots to get high, to make high leverage turns. So talk to me about the kind of the split on this. I remember the first time I played um, the, the Mirrodin, uh, Mirrodin limited format, not like the one back in like 2010 and I, my first draft deck was really bad because I had both Metalcraft and Infect cards. Like I didn't really get that you were supposed to be Metalcraft or Infect. I feel like this deck has got, like, the Ruin Crab and Soaring Thought Thief half the deck all the way down to playing Didn't Say Please. That's a hitter. Uh, and then it's got these other regular creatures, right, that are... Like, oh, let's just do damage, let's be Flash. Well, no, it's, they're, they're still rogues, though. Like, Soaring Thought Thief powers up your rogues. And uh, as a result, you get more mileage out of Brazen Borrower, which is a fantastic card in its own right. I mean, the only reason they weren't playing it was because of Lurus. And then Zareth Sand the Trickster is, uh, you know, it's pretty good. Um, on its own, and if you're going to be able to just play a flash deck, you know, like, this is a deck that already has 12 other flash creatures. So you don't think there's any, like, weird don't draw too many from either half of the deck sort of thing going on? No, no, I don't think so. I think it's like, uh, I mean, do you think it's a weird don't draw the wrong half of the deck thing with fairies? Because this deck is trying to play fairies, and even though Zara Sand, the trickster, is like a different sort of thing to Mistbind Click, it's not like 
fairies is like, oh, you know, sometimes you draw the blue black control deck and sometimes you draw the fairy beatdown deck. Yeah, that they both both of those draws exist and those are ways of dividing the cards in the deck in half. But they work together, right? Yeah, I think that the the crab half of the deck actually feeds the Zareth San card in the deck pretty well, given given the right amount of time. It just seems Maybe I'm just not used to looking at it. That's really the problem. Yeah, I think you've been hypnotized by the Dream Den, man. I mean, that card is is very hypnotic. It's it's a high performer in like every format. Even when they banned the original companion rule, it continues to perform in in older formats. I do think that uh, history has shown Yorion to be uh, the, the the at least in standard. The, the the winner of the new companion rule oh, era. There's no question about that. Obviously, the Dream Den uh, at three mana, especially when it was being paired with like a bazillion super cheap cards like Baubles, right? You know, one one prowess guys and Baubles. I mean, the tax, the three mana tax on that companion is telling. The three mana tax on a deck that, like, its objective in standard is to have, like, 11 lands in play and, and you know, make a 1 1 creature with some of them at the end of your turn. There's, like, no tax at all there. <laughs> You're like, oh, three mana? I wasn't going to use eight of this 11 mana this turn anyway. Uh, what did you like more out of the Esper versus blue black side? Like, Doom Foretold versus blue black control? I mean, these are, despite or blue sharing, black and sharing uh, you know, two thirds of their colors, if you're going to count count Esper that way, are very different. You know, from one another. Uh, I like Demir Control, which you know, coincidentally won the tournament, uh, way better than than Esper Doom Foretold right now. I think so too. I think that the Doom Foretold stuff is cool; could be fancy. But at the end of the day, it's not like that's what actually the format's calling for. You know, we talked about uh, Demir Yorion for the last couple of weeks, and here there's not it's not revolutionizing, like, it's not a reinventing the wheel at all, but it is notable packing four simulacrum alongside three Atreus Oracle of Half Truths. You know, a lot of the lists we were seeing were only playing one or the other. Additionally, uh, that third copy of Elspeth's Nightmare, I mean, that's something you talked about two weeks ago. Um, and, and here, in fact, we see the, uh, the fourth copy in the sideboard as well. I, I just really think that the, the Demir deck kind of knows where, where it's at, knows where it's going, knows where it sits in the metagame in, in a way that the Esper Doom Foretold deck doesn't. Like, the Esper Doom Foretold deck, if it... If it gets the right stuff in the right matchups, it looks fantastic. Like, I think the really the the biggest kind of textural delta between these two decks I point out is like the Esper deck can play Elspeth Conquers Death, right? Like both decks play Elspeth's Nightmare. Both decks play Omen of the Sea, right? But the Esper deck has Elspeth Conquers Death. Okay, Elspeth Conquers Death is fantastic. Unbelievably good sometimes. Like that Skyclad card, Apparition's no joke either. I mean, I think people were chatting, was Skyclad, Skyclave Apparition just the best white creature ever? Probably not. But it is really hella pervasive. And I don't see how you can in good conscience pick it over Stoneforge Mystic. I agree. And for me personally, I'm still taking Academy Rector over it. It's not the best white card in the set that it was printed in. But I think people were talking about things like that. <laughs> I will remind you that Omnath had a white pip. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. This, you know, the Esper deck, I guess it's fine. It's just, it just seems like you're trying harder to do what the blue black deck does more more easily. My and problem you with do have more power, but I think that the, the consistency and the uh, efficiency of the, the Demir deck is just uh, enough better. Is like clearly enough better to be for sure the way I would go as well. I I don't think it has more power than the Demir deck, really. Like it can put a bunch of different kinds of permanents out, right? It can put out. You're just talking about Ugin in terms of how big the end game is. I think that the fact that Ugin can sweep all the fancy permanents that the Esper deck puts out 
effortlessly, and the Esper deck can't stop the Demir deck from casting its Ugin, but the Demir deck can easily stop the Esper deck from casting Dance of the Mance or or Doom Foretold, rendering the Esper deck into having a bunch of air, basically, is yeah, a is a I, pretty telling di- difference. I, I guess I'm not talking about the uh, the head to head so much as if you look at the number of cards in the Esper deck that can actually generate an advantage. First of all, Esper, like uh, Mangucci's playing one plus three Orion instead of just one. And there's no denying that Yorion is just way better. It's like a better card in the Esper deck, right? Yeah, there's more cool permanence to blink. Right, and um, Treacherous Blessing. That's a lot of, you know, between Treacherous Blessing and Elspeth Conquers Death and Doom Foretold and Dance of the Mance, there's just like so many cards in this deck that generate an advantage. There's a lot more air in the Demir deck, but that's actually, you know, if the Demir deck's paying for that consistency by having cards that are giving it consistency instead of just more powerhouse cards. Maybe uh, the Demir deck's big game is better, um, is bigger, and I'll grant you that, and that's another reason why I like Demir better, but just being Devil's Advocate, the, uh, the Esper deck has more individual cards that are going uh, to yield you an advantage. Well, yeah, I think like almost by definition, all the non-interactive cards in the in the Esper deck are generally like generating an advantage themselves, right? They're Omen of the Sun, they're Elspeth's Nightmare, and a Elspeth. lot of the interaction is too. Doom foretold, Elspeth conquers death. Yeah, I, I would agree right, with like, that. The, the I I really think that the the reason that I like the Demir deck better is is I think the Demir deck is favored in the head to head in game one, especially. Um. I think, like, broader metagame, uh, you know, the the Esper deck, does it even have better removal? Actually, that's a... that's a, I'm, I, In the broader metagame, I still hate Demir over everything, personally. I, I but, think I'm, I'm in that same camp, right? Like, the, like, you would think normally, we're like, all right, I have white, so I have, like, better, better interaction, but this deck doesn't have any, like... White Wrath of God main deck, you know, nothing like that. It's it's got like Skyclave Apparition, uh, versus the Demir deck is actually actively playing, um, you know, four copies of Extinction Event in the main, in the main deck. So not only does it have a lot of the one for one removal, if you're going up against creatures, it can actually generate card advantage, uh, you know, against multiple creatures. It can remove certain creatures from the game that might be problematic if if they were coming out of the out of the graveyard. Um, so I actually, I, I agree with you. I vehemently agree with you. I like it in the creature decks matchup, uh, the creature matchups better. So over in, uh, historic, uh, we did see, you know, the wrath white sweeper type of action in a control deck. Uh, what do you think of Brad Barkley's blue white control deck with, uh, multiple main deck graph stickers cages, uh, search for his Kanta coming back. Um, an interesting mix of permission. And then winning with two Narset and four Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. Uh, I I got to admit, I was kind of head-scratching on those Graft Diggers cages. Uh, it, not that it's not a good card, right? I just thought it was an unusual choice to have in the main deck of an Azorius control deck. Like, Uro is, like, pretty strong against this deck, right? Yes, yes. Um... I guess it's super mana efficient. You know, it's pretty cheap. If somebody doesn't have, you know, same lesson that we learned from Lucky Clover and Standard. If they don't have the right removal for it, it's not going anywhere and it's going to be problematic for people. Uh, I just still still think it's kind of a weird card to have in the main deck. But I probably... It's non-traditional, that's for sure. Uh, I love the return of not just one, not two, not three, but four copies of Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. Uh, that card is extraordinarily powerful and a very good way to win. Um, I think that, you know, there's a bunch of two mana, uh, two mana permission in this deck. Aether Gust, Sensor, Disdainful Stroke, uh, that, you know, works pretty well with, with Fairy. I mean, for that matter, other two mana cards like Baffling End, Search for Escanta could be reasonably synergistic with it. Uh, so do you like this uh, this control approach enough in a, in a format so heavily dominated by the Eurodex? No. 
Uh, that's, I mean, like that, that's kind of the deck of the top eight is like Uro X, right? Like either with or without Yashan. Uh, either Sultai or Sultai Splash Yasharn. I, th- I mean, I'm just very enchanted by the Yasharn decks. Uh, I, I mean, to answer the question, I just, I don't really like the Azorius take. I mean, just in the abstract, uh, it's, you know, it's not, it, it, it's doing nothing that some of the other decks in the top eight couldn't also have done if they wanted to. And they have additional advantages, you know, notably Uro, other card advantageous creatures. Like, it, it, imagine you had like a deck that was blue, white, and, you know, two or three other colors. You could play Teferi if you wanted to. And people have in the past, right? You could do that. Um, it, it's not not synergistic with, uh, with uh, the kinds of cards they're playing. They just happen to be playing uh, other planeswalkers, right? Like Nyssa or. You know other big spells like Hydroid Crisis instead. So I, it, do you see what I'm saying, Patrick? Like if they wanted to, they could do it. They just choose not to. And and from my perspective, kind of says something. Uh, who's Yasharn? Uh, you know, four color Uro Yasharn deck. Did you like more, uh, Magnes or Manguchi and and Nelson, who uh, played the the same list? I mean, I I got to go with whatever deck Brad played. Like that's that's just going to be my default answer. Uh, I mean, uh, part of it is because I saw Brad's first, so maybe I was <laughs> just like, dude, mono. So, Brad. what do you think of having two more Yasharns in the sideboard to go all the way up? Uh, they obviously had a read on this card. <laughs> that's, that's what it says to me. Um, it seemed, I mean, I don't know. Is it is is it better to have that card just? with greater regularity. So you cast it, um, as early as possible. And then I don't know, you can block with it. Is that, is that what you want additional insurance for? Uh, I don't know about all the, uh, I, I blocking. Isn't the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. But Yasharn. Yasharn is not the most powerful card to be bringing in and matchups where people might have aether gusts, right? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, it's not that bad. Like you did all right on the way in, right? Um, yeah, it's just, uh, you, and you can, you can cast it next turn, right? But it's, uh, you know, I meant like, what if they counter it with Aether Gusts, right? Like, that's a, that's a very common thing that people might have. Like, for example, the champion, um, Brad Barkley had Aether Gusts in his main deck. The, uh, the ability to use it against goblins is like pretty key, right? Don't you want to keep them off Skirk Prospector? Yes, you're right. Yeah, you know, of course you're right. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's I mean, like the big the thing. The ability to keep them off of Muxus when you've got when you're stopping both Frexian Tower and Skirk Prospector, it's just you know uh, such a key way to slow down the uh, the explosiveness of this deck because you can go over the top of them as long as they don't get Muxus going. So I think. Given the fact that Brad's deck has two Yasharn in the sideboard, uh, I'm uh, mono in the in the the camp of of. of oh, here's Brad's, something that might Brad's deck you might better. have you torn though. Uh, so Brad and Manguchi had uh, a Doom Whisper in the sideboard, whereas uh, Luca had two copies of Elder Gargaroth. Um, you know, two Shark Typhoon and two Elder Gargaroth instead of three Shark Typhoon, one Doom Whisperer. I, I'm in the camp of the Doom Whisperer plus uh, uh, plus the additional Shark Typhoon. That makes me like Brad's deck even more. Uh, the Elder Gargaroth seems... The classic Doom Whisperer Yasharn combo. Uh, but the Elder Gargaroth seems like a low-impact card relative to a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. Like, do you want Elder Gargaroth in the mirror? <laughs> right? No. It, it's like, that seems super less impact than the additional Yasharns for the Goblins matchup. Right? Like, you know, you can turn off Skirk Prospector in the Goblins matchup versus not being able to turn it off. I mean, unless, I, I guess if people are playing like regular Mono Red Beatdown or something against you, then Elder Gargaroth is way better, but those were not the decks that were in the top eight. No. Uh, Luca did have the kind of you know, uh, eyebrow raising Yeheni's expertise. 
Um, yeah, that card seems less exciting than than some other options. But you can you can you, it, huh? you can get Henny's expertise and you know drop an accelerator, right? That's a thing you can do. You can get Henny's expertise and you know get him with a, a fatal push or something. That 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 seems like something that would be super redundant. You just redundant. like extinction event that much more than Yehenny's expertise in this format. I think like, I mean, I I would want to know what you're getting out of Yehenny's expertise. So if you play against goblins, goblins actually can straddle a little bit. If you Yehenny's expertise, you get to hit, uh, you get to hit both halves. You know, like you could hit Krenko. And the uh, the the war chief or the chieftain or you know you you get everything and uh, except Muxus if somehow that gets down but you got to try to Yasharn that the uh, the other thing is Yehenny's expertise y- Yasharn lives through it whereas extinction event is not always going to be so clean and then finally uh, there is you know at least a little bit of value to the mana efficiency uh, it, it's a little sad that. In game one, you don't have any like powerful follow ups, but at least you have Narset in the sideboard as a as a sweet thing. But that's probably not even for the Henny's expertise matchups. Yeah, I don't think those guys are in the deck at the same time, right? Like in eh, not that often, no. Uh, I can't. I would say, but if there's a Muxus, right? You can Henny's expertise all the guys that are already down, and then like Aether Gust the Muxus. That's cool, right? I'd do uh, that. So, uh, what do you think of uh, the possibility of just using like Cry of Car- of the Carnarium, like uh, Yellow Hat? Nasif uh, went without Yasharn, without the Yasharn splash, um, with uh, instead just uh, a little bit more interaction elements. You know, Maelstrom Pulse, Cry of the Carnarium. Yeah. Um, what do you think of this version? This yeah. is even a little bit more, uh, a little bit more controlling than we usually see out of these decks, but not by too much, right? You know how I feel. But you don't have the scavenging moves that Merkel had or the Vraska Golgari Queen. I, I I think that the ones that don't have the white splash are, are just a little bit worse. Um I, I mean, I don't know. Like nothing about Cry of the Carnarium or a couple Maelstrom pulses or whatever leads me to believe that I should have, you know, the color cut. I think you just get so much out of the White Splash that... I mean, like, the White Splash decks still played, like, four Nissa Who Shakes the World, right? Like, they still had room for main deck Aether Gust. Um, yep. I, I, it just seems to me like... I, w- I mean, I understand there's not a lot of white, different white cards. Uh, but You're the, literally just playing your charm. But the ones that they have seem super high impact. Um, so, I mean, besides which, I like the card advantage. It's nice. I do think it's kind of cute that if you're not going to play Yasharn, at least you get to play Languish, which is a pretty dope sweeper. I mean, but I'm in for Yasharn also. But you could just play Languish, right? Like, I mean, just like, all right, I, I guess I have Languish. It's not... There have been many decks in the past that people killed their own creatures. You know? Like, it's it's okay. Like that, that creature, first of all, already drew you two extra cards if it dies. And separately, your follow-ups are cards like Nissa Who Shakes the World. Actually, that's a reason not to play Languish. <laughs> Nissa Who Shakes the World and like Hydrate yeah. Crisis. So uh, the last deck I wanted to talk about, um, Burchette's Mono Red uh, Goblins with uh, two copies of Harold's Horn in the uh, sideboard. I mean... That's just because Autumn didn't play all of them in the main deck, right? There are two copies of Harold's Horn in the main deck here. Uh, Harold's Horn seems unbelievable to me in this deck, right? So Harold's Horn says, as Harold's Horn enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Probably going to choose goblins, right? True. Uh, Creature spells you cast of the chosen type cost one less to cast. So if you had multiple Harold's Horns, for sake of argument get multiple discounts right yeah uh, for, you know those occasions where you're playing literally just Krenko or muxus but you could get them no uh, matron you can get the matron no you got like ringleader in the sideboard you know goblin trash master there's all kinds of things you can get well, and 
the matron actually is kind of interesting with multiple herald torrents because you get to go off, right? Yeah, for sure. But like you then, just get to spend one mana, one mana, one mana, one mana. But like, it's not the three mana conversion for the one mana discount that I think Autumn is in for. It's this last line of text, which is at the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature card of the chosen type, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. If your deck is like 31 goblins, which Autumn's is, you have a pretty good hit rate on this. Definitely. So like, like if- you also have a it's it's not like you have absolutely zero control, right? Like sometimes you get to know what's on top because of the snoop and you get to reshuffle or not depend you know like depending on what's on top. Like if you have a muxus on top that you just can't cast, you might decide to play a chief in that turn whereas if you have on top of your deck an extra land that you don't need, you might decide to play the Matron instead to give yourself a shuffle and a 50-50 shot at Harold's Horning for free next turn. And there's also subtle things like you have Gem Palm Incinerator, right? So you can Gem Palm... If you know the top card of your library, for example, you can Gem Palm Incinerator to change the top card of your library, right? Like that's... No. That's like a... Probably not like a small thing even. Uh, I, th- I think that the just the grinding advantage that you get here... like. If you just like, all right, I'm just one for one trade every single creature that I draw. And you can't even do that in some cases. The creatures are two card advantageous to play that way. But uh, pretend that you could. Like, somebody who doesn't have Herald's Horn and doesn't have some card advantageous way of dealing with artifacts is almost inevitably going to fall behind on just material against you. Definitely. Uh, I will say the one other thing that I, I I think Mindstone is actually pretty smart here. Yeah, that's an These unusual choice. Really struggled from a lack of two drops. Uh, I like that choice a lot, um, and it's really unusual. But uh, it seems like it's doing something here. Like, uh, you know, just the ability to go to Krenko or Muxus a turn early seems awesome. Definitely. I think it's just such a good way to put your two drop spot to, to actual on plan use. Um, finally, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty popular. It's pretty commonplace at this point, but I do like the use of iron crag feet in the uh, sideboard. When your opponent drops you a Sharn, the fact that you can just iron crag feet instead of uh, being reliant on the, uh, the tower or the prospector to jump straight to Muxus it's a very powerful added angle, right? It's cool. It's cool. I mean, you've still potentially got some problems, but, uh, you know, it does give you something to do there. Uh, I don't I'm not that excited by it, though. No? No, I mean, it's... Dude, it's, I don't know. If you resolve a Muxus against those people... Yeah. You're doing real big things. Uh, but, you know, they can, they can card advantage you back, right? Like, all those... All those decks that we talked about have some kind of extinction event or languish or cry of carnarium or Yahenny's expertise that they can hit you back with. And you're down an iron crag feet. So it's hard to say you're down the feet when you're up five cards. You're up the Muxus. (laughs) Muxus is much more valuable than an extra card, but. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like five black lotuses and five card draws. Uh, so what do you think, man? Are you uh, sticking with four four color Yasharn? Uh, I like my heart four color Yasharn. Uh, Brad Nelson's list in particular. Sorry, Nasif. Normally, I'm, uh, I'm such a big Nasif fan, but I think that missing the the white splash, I didn't like it. But I actually have to vote for Autumn this week. I think this Goblin's That's... deck is a work of inspiration. Exactly. I. Uh... My heart wants to go with Yasharn as well, but I do think that this uh, that Burchett's Goblin stack is like the smartest advancement of technology for one of these decks. It's it's like it has a beatdown game, but it's really it's like one of these decks that wants to play the game as a puzzle, and I kind of love that aspect of it. But it could <laughs> still beat you down. Or it can just bury you in card advantage. It has, like, all these different angles. Uh, and I just think that the, the Herald's Horn, I feel like 
the un, like you just play this herald's horn, and if they're not ready for the herald's horn on that turn, th- you're just gonna beat them with it. That's what I love about this deck, and like they can have whatever clever plan that they want. Every one of your creatures in this deck, almost, I mean, like, the Snoop for sure, the Wily Goblin, all these mana cheating guys, all these hasters, you know, not to mention the ones that say draw X cards next to them. Like, any one of those as a freebie is probably pretty bad for your opponent. But three of them or something is a freebie? Oh, come on. All right. Awesome, dude. Uh, I guess another uh, championship in the book. Yep. See you next week. Bye. Dredge is a jailer, hey. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis, hey. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a vault with nothing but time. Parents and my friends were the key to find. Magic gave me purpose and drive. The game, the love, kept me alive. Visions, a better weather light inside. To do the most.